of advanced uh, uh, water and waste water treatment uh, <coughs> webinar series so last 6 uh, days we discussed discussed on several proper, uh, several ways of treatment of water and waste water including electrochemical method and bioelectrochemicals then uh, catalytic oxidation everything so today is a slightly different it is the uh, today professor ashok muth ashok kumar muth pandian is with us he will discuss on the uh, application of ultrasonic and sonar chemistry in water and waste water so along with professor ashok muth ashok kumar muth pandian we have uh, uh, two experts one is professor t shivashankar from nit trichy and dr shankar chakma from uh, iser bopal before starting the program i just introduce professor muthupandian ashok kumar professor muthupandian ashok kumar is a senior academic staff member of school of chemistry university of melbourne australia he is currently the assistant deputy vice chancellor international at university of melbourne the major india engagement projects he has established include melbourne india postgraduate academy and the university of melbourne academy for blended learning and teaching in collaboration with indian academic institutions ashok professor uh, ashok kumar has made major contributions of applied sonar chemistry to the materials food and dairy industry uh, research uh, recent research also involves the ultrasonic synthesis of functional nano and biomaterials for energy production environmental remediations and diagnostic and therapeutic medicine he was the deputy director of an australian research council funded by industry transformation research hub he is the editor in chief of ultrasonics and sonar chemistry an international journal devoted to sonar chemistry research with the journal impact factor of 7.3 he has edited co-edited several books and special issues for journals he has published more than 400 referred journals with h index of 61 in high impact international journals and books and delivered over 200 keynotes or plenary lectures at international conferences and in academic institutions professor ashok kumar please okay so uh, is that okay now to share the screen ah please share the screen Okay, first of all uh, uh, i'd like to thank um, um, the institute for for the invitation um you know and also that th thank you for this um, you know brief introduction about uh, my profile and i'm very pleased to kind of um, um, uh, do the presentation today on ultrasonics and sonar chemistry for um, waste treatment applications or waste water treatment applications Uh, i just put it as general water treatment applications so i will be talking about various things and most of the studies that i will be reporting are based on uh, laboratory scale um, um investigations that will also um, indicate um, in terms of large scale um, processing and possibilities and and show some some instrumentations um, that are available in this area so i would like to um, you know again acknowledge and and thank um, all of you for um, listening to my talk at the start and um, as i was introduced i am the assistant deputy vice chancellor international at the university of melbourne so i would like to spend uh, maybe 2 3 minutes uh, to uh, introduce the university of melbourne to you and then i will talk about the research part so what you see here is some of the buildings um, um, of the university of melbourne and um as you can see here it is um it was established in 1853 and is second oldest university in australia um so it has some um, kind of traditional value to it so what 160 years of creating leaders uh, um many of our graduates uh, went through for example as prime ministers and ministers and uh, great scientists and so on so i'd like to again acknowledge that part and the university of melbourne uh, has about seven campuses um, as you can see listed here parkville south bank etc 
And the main campus is uh, in the city of Melbourne, which is called Parkville campus. That's where uh, about almost like 99% students um, um, you know, study. The rest of the campuses are purpose built. Uh, for example, the campus in um, Werribee that's uh, devoted to uh, veterinary science because you need a bigger land. Uh, same with uh, Burnley, where we do more into agriculture. And South Bank is more of an uh, arts precinct. So they, we, all these uh, institutions are, uh, sorry, campuses are relatively smaller. The main campus is the Parkwood campus. And I'll show you a photograph of that in the next slide or so. But uh, at the outset, I would like to also acknowledge um, the traditional owners of um, um, the land in Australia. So most of you may know about uh, Aboriginal people and Australia um, you know, belonged to the Aborigines uh, for uh, millions of years uh, until uh, the British take uh, took over um, uh, Australia. And so at this stage, wherever we go, where, whatever we do or where, any meetings we have to, or we normally uh, tend to acknowledge uh, and pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which the campus of the university uh, has been built. They're called Runjari people and Brun, Run, Run people at Parkville, Southwick, South Bank, Werribee and Burnley campuses. Okay. With that acknowledgement, I'm just now showing some photographs that shows the main entrance to the university. So you can see um, uh, the, the main arch, for example, the, the entrance. Uh, the woman chica, the, that uh, ter term here is the welcome in Aboriginal language. The city of Melbourne that you can see here, and uh, the bay part is um, towards the south of the city. And our campus, the uh, University of Melbourne campus is in the, uh, uh, located on the north side of the city. So about maybe 10 minutes walk to the city center from the campus. So most of our departments are located in this region. And what you see here, the small buildings are um, colleges. And when I say colleges, they are equal to um, our uh, hostels in, 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 in India. So students residences, okay. And on top of this part, we also have a, a biomedical precinct here. So some hospitals, some biomedical research, uh, um, you know, buildings around here. Just some statistics, um, the University of Melbourne is ranked uh, number one based on the Times Higher Education ranking. And uh, that's kind of within Australia, ranked number 32 globally. That kind of fluctuates anywhere between 30 to 40 in a, um, you know, every year. But um, the Melbourne University is always in the top uh, 40 or so in the past 10 years. And we have a student population of about 70,000. And you may be wondering why we have that many numbers. <clears throat> Unlike in India, where we do undergraduate teaching, uh, postgraduate teaching in colleges, here we don't have colleges. So all the students have to study at the university for, at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. That's why we have um, a relatively bigger number. And the other thing that I want to highlight here is about 40% of uh, our students are international. And the primary market, uh, international market is China. The second is um, you know, India, followed by um, other Asian countries and Europe. And the other thing that I also want to highlight is the, the uh, university spends about $1.2 billion every year uh, in research. Half of that funds come through competitive research grants and half of the grant comes through our teaching uh, income. So that's about the um, you know, brief introduction to the university. Now I'm uh, trying to show my own research group in terms of collaborators and postdocs and students. The reason I'm showing uh, the list of these people is to, to acknowledge their contribution to the uh, data that I'm going to share with you today. So most of the discussions that we will have is based on um, the learning that um, I learned through my collaborators listed here, but also contributions from my postdocs and PhD students. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank their contributions before we look into my research part. Again, before I go into the details of um, the research data, 
I need to give you some brief introduction about ultrasound and how ultrasound can generate chemical reactions. So we, we need to understand the basics of it. I always tell this to uh, wherever I go. If, I, if you are working in a particular research field, the important part is that you have to have a clear understanding of the basic concepts. Without that understanding, if you try to uh, you know, achieve some, um, you know, try to resolve some problems, research problems, most probably it will be very difficult. And you know, if you just try to go through trial and uh, methodologies. So I'm just going to spend maybe about 10 minutes or so to, to show some basics that I learned over a um, you know, period of five years or so, it's still I'm trying to learn. And, and I'm trying to give that a brief account within 10 minutes or so, at least it gives you some basic concepts behind sonochemistry. And then you will be able to appreciate uh, the um, research um, you know, outcomes that I'm going to share with you. So coming to the uh, ultrasound, ultrasound as we know is part of the uh, sound um, you know, category. So we call uh, ultrasound because um, the sound waves that we are using, the frequency range is much higher than what we can hear. So if, uh, if you know a little bit about the frequencies of ultrasound, anywhere between 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz, that's the range where the humans uh, can hear, our ear can respond. That 20 kilohertz is upper limit. And as you get older and older, that will uh, decrease. For example, uh, older people can maybe only uh, hear up to 16 or 18 kilohertz rather than 20 kilohertz. If you are younger, your uh, ear may be responsive to even up to 22 kilohertz. And um, the infrasound is below, again, you can hear below the frequency. And the infrasound is used by animals for communication. Ultrasound is also used for, um, for communication by, by um, some animals. Dolphins, for example, use ultrasound for communication and also um, military uses underwater communication through some ultrasound and so on. And most of us are known to ultrasound through um, imaging. For example, when you have um, a baby or, or a tumor or any other problem um, in your body, the doctor will ask you to scan your body using ultrasound. So I'll bring this part, um, you know, point for discussion a little bit later um, in terms of why it is safe to use ultrasound even though we can create chemical reactions using ultrasound. So we'll come to that point later. So most of, uh, you know, where the chemistry starts, the chemistry starts because ultrasound interacts with material, in particular liquid. So as kids, we used to play uh, with bubbles. As adults, we also play with bubbles in different ways. But if you have an interaction between ultrasonic waves and bubbles in liquids, then there is a process that happens that is called acoustic cavitation. The acoustic cavitation or cavitation itself is simply formation of cavities or bubbles in a liquid. And that includes formation, growth, and collapse of these bubbles. So what you see here in a video clip is that a bubble is growing and collapsing. And on your right-hand side, what you see is the radius time curve. The radius of that bubble increases and then collapses, and then increases and collapses. So what is important here that you need to understand is the bubble radius that we are talking about is about 100 microns. This is about 20 kilohertz frequency that we are talking about. So the size of the bubble is much, much smaller. That's one aspect. The second aspect is the time scale that is involved. So if I'm using 20 kilohertz sound waves, then a single acoustic cycle corresponds to about 50 microseconds. It's a very fast time scale. So we are looking into very, very small size of the bubbles oscillating in a liquid. And also the oscillation itself is very fast. It grows maybe in 10 microsecond, collapses within a microsecond. And that's very crucial to generate chemistry. And if you have learned a little bit of thermodynamics um, during your undergraduate or postgraduate um, studies, 
And based on the thermodynamics, whenever you have a change in volume, then that change in volume leads to some work done or some sort of energy generated. So the, the equation that you may remember is W work is equal to P delta V. So what we are looking here is that change in volume. When the bubbles are growing and collapsing, there is a change in volume. And that change in volume is responsible for generating work. The work that the bubble is doing is nothing. So what happens is all the work that is done is converted into heat. So that heat that you are generating due to this volume change in a very short period of time is quite high. For example, it can reach up to 2000 or 5000 Kelvin equivalent of heat within these bubbles. So what I'm trying to, to kind of show you in a very short um, you know, introduction part is that in a small volume within that liquid, we are generating large amount of heat because of this collapse. Now, the other thing that you have to also understand is that collapse itself is considered as a near adiabatic collapse. Again, I'm using a thermodynamic term. An adiabatic process means no heat is lost to the surroundings. So when the heat is not lost, then all the heat is preserved within the bubble for very, very short period of time. So for that short period of time, the temperature can be much, much, much higher. So if I take a liquid like this, for example, uh, uh, in a glass full of liquid or simply water, that liquid will have some small bubbles. When the ultrasound passes through, that bubble will start oscillating because of the pressure fluctuations that you have here. That pressure fluctuation results in the growth of the bubble. The mechanism behind this growth of the bubble is called rectified, rectified diffusion process. But if I want to explain the rectified diffusion process, that itself will take 20 minutes. So we don't want to go too much into the de details. But in simple term, what happens is when the bubble is expanding, the gas molecules that are present in the liquid or even the solvent like water, they can evaporate into the bubble. And as you can see during the expansion phase, the surface area is increasing. So the amount of material like water vapor or air, oxygen, nitrogen, et cetera, the amount that can diffuse into the bubble is much, much larger compared to when the bubble is shrinking because the surface area is lower here, the amount that is getting out is smaller. So due, due to that difference in the mass flowing into flowing out, the bubble starts to grow. And then it grows to, towards a size called resonance size. When the resonance size is reached, then it starts to collapse and then repeatedly do this kind of growth and collapse continuously. And that leads to the, uh, the energy generation that I was just mentioning. So in simple terms, this slide summarizes what's happening in terms of the energy generation or chemistry that's happening. And uh, this, you know, if, if I want to really go through the whole process, it may take uh, an hour for me to explain to you. But at this stage, you just need to trust that when the bubble is collapsing very fast due to the near adiabatic process, then you are generate or we are generating about 5,000 to 10,000 or 15,000 Kelvin within this bubble. That um, temperature is there for a very short period of time, like less than a microsecond. And because the volume is decreasing, the pressure is also increasing. So the heat is there, high pressure is there. That's where the chemistry can start. So for example, I mentioned it to you that water molecules can evaporate. Oxygen molecules are, or nitrogen molecules are there as part of the dissolved air. When you subject these molecules to high temperature, like 5,000 Kelvin or 10,000 Kelvin, then the heat is enough to break the bond. For example, you may be able to break the hydrogen oxygen bond once you break the hydrogen oxygen bond, then you can generate radicals. For example, hydrogen atom and hydroxyl radicals. I'll, I'll come to that point later on. And this, once you generate radicals, then the radicals can induce redox reactions. And that's where the chemistry starts. 
I have mentioned here light emission, which is called sonoluminescence. We are not going to go into the detail, but in simple term, your bubble acts like a hot body. Okay, so when a hot body with the high temperature and and chemical species are there, then you can have excitation of the the molecules that can relax back to emit light through phosphorescence, fluorescence, etc. But also like a black body black body emission. If you have a hot body that can also uh, emit light due to the, um, you know, electron being emitted and the electron re um, uh, you know, recombining with the ions. So there are also lots of theories there, but today's topic is not concerned with the light emission, so I'm not going to talk about that today. So we are going to look at the radical generation. We are look, uh, going to also look at these physical forces, shock waves, micro jet shear forces, etc. For example, when a bubble is sitting on a surface, that surface can be a particle that is floating in the liquid. Then due to the uneven distribution of the acoustic force, the bubble collapses asymmetrically, generating a micro jet. That jet has very high speed, for example, 200 meters per second. Even though the mass of this jet is very small, the velocity is so high, the kinetic energy of this jet is much higher that can lead into making small hole or pore in the particles or the surfaces. That can be, for example, uh, used to increase the surface area of catalytic particles. So indirectly, you can increase the surface area, which means you can increase the catalytic reactions. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. When the bubble is collapsing, as I said, you have a high pressure inside the bubble. After the bubble collapse, the high pressure will get back into the medium in terms of a pressure wave, and that's the shock wave. So in here, what can happen is the shock wave can push molecules around or particles around, and that means you increase the collision frequency. So those you know a little bit of the chemical kinetics, simply by increasing collision between molecules, you can increase the rate of chemical reactions. So these kind of uh, shear forces and shock waves kind of physical forces can be used to increase the rate of chemical reactions simply by increasing the mass transfer, okay? So all these uh, things will be used to, to um, you know, understand some of the effects that we see in chemical reactions later on. So one of the things that I'm going to show you is a video clip that shows how strong the shear forces are. For example, here I have a 400 micron capillary. There is a, a, a bubble trapped, a transducer sitting at the bottom here. So when the, the bubble is driven by the transducer, the bubble starts to oscillate. Here I have an aqueous slurry. And you can see that due to this kind of oscillation of the bubble, the aqueous slurry is pushed and the, the particles around the bubble are pushed very fast. And as I said uh, before, this kind of mass transfer effects can be used, for example, to clean surfaces of sand or soil that is contaminated, okay? So we'll come to that point later on. Here, I'm showing another example where the physical forces are used, for example, to make an emulsion. I have water here, I have some oil, the ultrasonic horn is coming from the top. So when I try to pass the ultrasound, you will see an emulsion being generated very, very quickly. So you can see that the physical forces are very strong that can be used for driving chemical reactions. And that's what we are going to look at later on, how these physical forces can be used for us to, for example, um, you know, do some um, water cleaning or decomposition of the organic molecules uh, or, um, or desorption of um, organic molecules from surfaces. I also talked about the chemistry that can be created within the bubble due to this high temperature. Here I'm giving water as an example. So assume that the bubble is oscillating and water evaporated into this bubble. And when the bubble is collapsing, we know that the bubble will reach maybe 2000 or 5000 or 10,000 degrees Celsius. And the part of that heat energy or thermal energy will be used to break the bond between hydrogen and oxygen that generates hydrogen atom and hydroxyl radicals. 
Now, hydroxyl radicals, most of you know, are oxidizing agents. So if I have a pollutant molecule, then I can use the hydroxyl radicals to oxidize the pollutant molecule to clean, for example, contaminated water. The hydrogen atom is a reducing agent. So if I want to reduce, for example, if I take a metal ion, I can use the hydrogen atom to reduce the metal ion to form metal particles. That means I can use them for making nanomaterials or nanometal particles. But also I can convert this reducing agent into an oxidizing agent. If I have oxygen or air in the inside the bubble, which is which will be normal, when I have air saturated water, along with water, I will have oxygen within the bubble. Oxygen can react with hydrogen atom and then generate HO2 radical, peroxy radical. And peroxy radical is also an oxidizing radical. So you can see that I can convert all the redox radicals into simply oxidizing radicals that can be used for oxidizing reactions. So they are the basic part of this, um, um, you know, the cavitation process where ultrasound is used to generate physical and chemical forces for applications. In our laboratory, we have been using this kind of basic um, processes like the physical forces and chemical forces generated through acoustic cavitation for applications in energy, environment, health, and food. So today we are going to mainly look into the environmental applications, but what I'm showing here in this picture is uh, an overview of what we can do. I already told you that the radicals that I'm generating can be used to make some functional nanomaterials. Here I'm showing a colloidal solution that has magnetic property that is prepared by ultrasound. I can make, um, I can make magnetized polymer particles. I can make uh, coarser particles. So they can be used for some catalytic applications. Most of my recent work is in food and dairy processing. In fact, most of my, most of my research grant comes through here where I can use the physical and chemical processes to increase the functional properties of food ingredients. For, for example, um, I can improve the um, um, nutritional value of milk. I can improve uh, the nutritional value of the proteins in milk and so on. So we do quite a lot of work in this area. So if, if anyone is interested <clears throat> to learn about this, I'm happy to send you some papers later on. We are also using this kind of uh, physical and chemical forces to make uh, biomedical biomaterials. For example, here we can use proteins to make this kind of thin shell. Within the shell, we can encapsulate either drugs or some nutrients. And once they are encapsulated within this, um, you know, protein shell, then they are protected from the environment. So the storage stability and targeted delivery kind of uh, thing can be improved. We recently have a, a project with um, uh, Gates Foundation where we are trying to deliver uh, nutrients through this technology that can, this kind of uh, microspheres with uh, nutrients like vitamins or minerals, um, you know, iron compounds and those kind of things can be encapsulated and then they can be put into normal food. For example, we can um, uh, incorporate them into chapatis or bread, and, and then you can store them for longer term um, without losing the functionality of this kind of microsphere. So that's one of our active areas. Other applications include, for example, sonar crystallization, et cetera. And, and today's talk primarily will be focused on how we are going to use um, the physical and chemical forces in wastewater treatment. One thing that you also need to know is if you're working in an ultrasonic field, you have to understand the effect of frequency for different applications. So I already told you that we can generate radicals, we can say generate physical forces, and ultrasound can also be used for imaging purposes, okay? And what you see in this particular plot is um, the hydrogen peroxide yield, the hydrogen peroxide yield is proportional to the amount of radicals that you are generating within these cavitation bubbles. 
what you can see is if I'm using 20 kilohertz low frequency ultrasound, then the amount of radicals that I generate is very, very low. Whereas the physical forces that I generate, you know, we saw that um, the amount of um, energy is enough to make an emulsion is much stronger. So for processing type kind of applications where you do not need radicals, low frequency is good. Whereas if I'm trying to make oxidation process or if I'm trying to make reduction process, pure chemistry, then I have to go for very high frequencies like you know 200 kilohertz, 300 kilohertz, or up to maybe 800 kilohertz. But what you can also see is the radical production goes increases with the increase in frequency and then decreases. So when you go to higher frequencies, more than one megahertz, the amount of radicals that you generate decreases. The reason behind is uh, quite complex, but in simple term, what you have to look into is the volume change, the volume change that happens per bubble. So if I take a 20 kilohertz frequency, the bubbles are much larger. So the energy generated per bubble is much larger. That's why the shear is much stronger. Whereas the number of bubbles is very small. For example, we generate very low number of bubbles because of the number of standing waves that you generate. The wavelength is much larger at low frequency. So the number of bubbles is much smaller. On the other hand, when you go to high frequencies, the amount of heat that you generate or radical that you generate per, bu per bubble is much smaller because the temperature generated in a, in a high frequency is small. But what happens is the number of bubble increases. So the, the picture that you see here shows that you have rel relatively more cavitation at high frequency, relatively less cavitation at low frequency. And that's why you have that change or increase in the radical yield. But when you go to very, very high frequencies, the bubble is oscillating so fast, you don't have time for material to diffuse into the bubble. So you may have more bubbles, but the bubbles are so small, the oscillation time is very, very short, that so you don't have much chemistry happening. And that's why the radical yield starts to decrease at high frequency. And that's where the application for imaging comes into picture. So even though we are generating radicals when the bubbles are oscillating, or when in, in the ultrasound is interacting with water, that's what this is happening. Our body has 80% water or 90% water in some places. So then why it is safe to scan your body? That's because the radical yield is decreasing with very well at high frequencies. For scanning your body, you will be using 10 megahertz, for example, where the time for cavitation is very low. So the cavitation bubbles will not even be generated at very, very high frequencies. And that's where for imaging purposes, you don't need cavitation. You just need the waves to get into the body and get reflected. And that's why it is quite safe uh, to use ultrasound to scan your body, even though we know chemistry can happen. Okay, so now we have some idea about all these different things. Now let's look into how we can use these physical and chemical forces for actual applications. Here I'm showing an, applica uh, 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 um, an application where we have graphene oxide. The graphene oxide is exfoliated using the physical forces that we generate at low frequency ultrasound. And simultaneously, we can also deposit metals. For example, in this case, we deposit gold on reduced graphene oxide. And the purpose of this is then we can use this kind of reduced graphene oxide metal loaded reduced graphene oxide as electrode materials for oxidation reactions or reduction reactions. So this is used, for example, in methanol oxidation fuel cells, okay? So you can see that a material that is being generated by the sonochemical process can be used, for example, for an oxidation reaction to generate energy. So I'm just going to quickly show you that there are two components to it. You're using ultrasound for water treatment. One needs to make materials. So the preparation of materials that has better catalytic property that can be used, for example, to 
photocatalytically oxidize or decompose organic materials, and then using the radicals themselves for oxidizing the organic materials. So here, for example, people have used like preparation of the titanium oxide the, using the usual method, but during that process, they use ultrasound. And using the ultrasound during the synthetic process increases the surface area of the material, but also it changes the functional properties of the material that increases the catalytic performance of the TaO2 TA nanoparticles. There are examples for that. In this case, for example, they have shown, or in, in, we have shown that using ultrasound, when you try to prepare the composite material that involves silver iodide and TaO2, when you try to use ultrasound, you get much smaller particles and even distribution of the dopant, in this case, silver iodide, on the surface of the TaO2 particles compared to the conventional methods. So you can see that there's a clear difference between the material that is prepared by ultrasound or in the presence of ultrasound compared to the absence of ultrasound. And that will uh, lead into an increase in the catalytic performance for decomposing organic pollutants. I'll come to this point later on. Now, um, you know, most of you know advanced oxidation process being used in, in wastewater treatment, uh, for example, ozone treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, advanced oxidation process has this kind of advantage. You know, they should uh, be leading into complete mineralization of the pollutants in water. And so there's no any kind of waste disposal, no um, side products or byproducts, and, and we can operate them under mild conditions. There are some examples given here. Common method people use um, in, in wastewater treatment is using ozone or hydrogen peroxide or a combination of these two. Sometimes they use in the absence and presence of ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet uh, ray, radiation. People tend to use titanium oxide or uh, semiconductor particles. So in combination with um, UV and hydrogen peroxide. So you can see that there are different methods available including fenton and electrolysis, et cetera. So sonolysis is one of those um, advanced oxidation process because it is in a way generates hydrogen peroxide, which can be used to decompose or oxidize organic pollutants in wastewater. So I'm going to, so people also know about the, um, the photocatalysis process. People uh, use, uh, for example, TaO2 as, uh, as a powder in solution. And when you shine um, um, you know, radiation on, uh, into the solution, you get um, an electron excited into the conduction band generating oxidizing holes. So if I now consider this to, to our um, cavitation bubbles, in cavitation bubbles also we are generating hydroxyl radicals, which are here generated through these holes. And we are generating hydrogen atom, which is equal to electron. The electron here reacts with the oxygen to form some oxidizing species. In our case, hydrogen atom reacts with oxygen to form HO2 radicals. So photocatalysis is a common way people use in, in, um, in wastewater treatment or um, in, for decomposing organic pollutants. The sonar chemistry can also be used for the same purpose. So here I'm giving you one example where simple sonar chemical degradation can be used to decompose organic pollutants. And I'm showing this example to highlight the disadvantage of using sonolysis for decomposing organic pollutants. And that is demonstrated in this plot. So first let us look at the mechanism here. The hydroxyl radical basically attacks the organic pollutant. So if it is uh, an organic pollutant that has a, a phenyl ring, like phenol or benzoic acid any, or any other aromatic pollutant, then the oxidizing radical attacks the phenyl ring and keep attacking that until you, uh, you open the ring. And that ultimately leads, leads to the mineralization of this compound. So that's a kind of similar mechanism. So in stuff, this, if you have photocatalysis, the photocatalysis will generate hydroxyl radicals, and then the rest of the reaction pathway will be similar. And the data on your 
on the other side, this data shows what is the problem with using sonar chemistry alone for the degradation of an organic pollutant. That is shown through this pH effect. So you can see that if the solution pH is say about 6.5, the decomposition rate of benzoic acid is much lower. If the solution pH is acidic, then the decomposition rate is much higher. And this is where you need to look into your acid-base chemistry. You know, if you know a little bit of uh, from your you know undergraduate chemistry, if you have a weak acid, a weak acid will have a pKa. So below the pKa, the acid will be in its neutral form. Above the pKa, the acid will be in the ionized form. So basically, it will be COO minus. And the benzoic acid has a pK it's roughly around say four or something. So we now look into the benzoic acid at very low pH where it is completely protonated and benzoic acid in deprotonated like benzoate COO minus. So what you can see is when it is in the neutral form, it is easy to decompose. When it is in the ionized form, the decomposition rate is much, much lower. Okay, and the reason for that is a neutral compound has more surface activity. What it means is if it can go to air water interface very quickly. Now, if you look into an air bubble, the bubble that is oscillating, the cavitation bubble, that bubble is hydrophobic in nature. Okay, so you an oscillation bubble has air water interface. So what this molecule will do is it will go to the interface. And because we are generating the hydroxyl radicals within the bubble, when the molecule is at the interface, the hydroxyl radical can easily attack the molecule, which means the reaction rate is much higher. On the other hand, if this is COO minus, that means it is ionic in nature, does not like the interface, it will be staying in the solution phase. That means the hydroxyl radical needs to go into water and then diffuse and find out an ionized molecule. During that diffusion process, hydroxyl radical can be interacting with another water molecule or it can interact with another hydroxyl molecule, so the reaction rate is much smaller. So if the molecules are at the interface, it's easy to do decomposition using the cavitation process. So what I'm trying to say here is the Sonolysis is a good oxidation process for hydrophobic molecules. It is not good for hydrophilic molecules. And so not all the pollutants are hydrophobic. Most of the pollutants, in fact, are hydrophilic in nature, for example, organic dyes. So you need to understand this mechanism before you try to use sonolysis for some uh, oxidation process. Now, I, I was going to show you this example, but we are already um, you know, running late. So I'm just going to skip this example. It's going to show you that surface activity is important for chemical reactions. So I, I have highlighted to you that if I try to use sonolysis alone, then it is good for decomposing hydrophobic compounds, but not good for hydrophilic compounds. But if you look into this mechanism here, what you are doing, is that once you put the hydroxyl radical into the phenyl ring, you are increasing the hydrophilicity of the molecule. So even though you can decompose or you can convert the primary pollutant quickly, the secondary pollutant that you generate is more water soluble. What it means is the mineralization process will be very slow if you are using sonolysis. On the other hand, if you try to use photocatalysis, photocatalysis, the most of the photocatalyst surface, they are good hydrophilic, they, they, they are charged. So they are good for hydrophilic compounds. For example, uh, uh, ionized compounds like the dye, organic dyes, they can easily absorb to TuO2 and they can get decomposed very quickly. So now you can see the problem here that if I'm trying to use sonolysis alone, then 
it is good for hydrophobic, but it is not good for the hydrophilic primary products. So I'm using photocatalysis, it's good for hydrophilic, but not for hydrophobic. So what people tend to do is they tend to use hybrid techniques. Hybrid technique means combining two different techniques. So in this case, people have tried to use sonolysis and photocatalysis together, which is called sonophotocatalysis for, for the decomposition of organic pollutants to overcome these disadvantages. So basically if I use sonophotocatalysis, I can degrade both hydrophilic and hydrophobic compounds. That means the process will be good for mineralization process. So rather than reading this, I'm just going to quickly go through some examples. Here, what you see is I'm taking 4-chlorophenol and using sonophotocatalysis and show that sonophotocatalysis is quite efficient to, decom de to decompose 4-chlorophenol. But here you don't see the difference between sonolysis or photocatalysis or sonophotocatalysis. What is important is for you to look at the products that are being generated during this process. So if I only look at the sono, sonolysis part, you can see that this is the HPLC, HPLC chromatogram that shows that with the increasing sonication time, the parent compound is decreasing. But when the parent the compound is decomposed, you start getting some, some secondary products or hydrophilic products. They are the ones that I already spoke to you, hydroxylated parent compounds, like hydroxylated chlorophenol. The hydroxylated chlorophenol are, phenols are more hydrophilic and they tend to stay much longer time. So you cannot decompose or the mineralization process is much slower. On the other hand, if you look at the sonophotocatalysis, you can see that it is clean process. You are decomposing the parent compound, but you don't see any byproducts being produced, which means the mineralization process is much more efficient, okay? So that's where I already told you that trying to understand the basic concepts of different processes and trying to combine them will be very helpful um, to achieve what you want to achieve in, in, um, in redox processes. Here, I'm just showing, you know, I'm trying to go, 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 to go very quickly. We are trying to combine, in this case, Fenton with the sonophotocatalysis to show that when you have a combined process of sonophotocatalysis, then the degradation process has, is much higher. And if you ask me whether it is synergistic, I'm not sure about it because basically you just simply see an additive effect. But even though the rate of decomposition shows an additive effect, you have an advantage of you know, not seeing the byproducts being produced, okay? The last bit of um, uh, you know, information before I go to the, the large scale reactors part is uh, one of the major issues people face when they try to use photocatalysts like the TaO2 uh, powder for photocatalytic purposes is that they tend to use nano uh, TaO2. The reason they tend to use nano TaO2 is because nano sized material will have much larger surface area. But the problem then is after you do the decomposition study, you have to filter the, the catalyst out of the water. And because the particles are so small, the filtration becomes very laborious or very time consuming. And also energy consum consumption is much higher. So one of the research that we have done is to make the um, photocatalytic particles of micron size without using the nano advantage of it's a nano sized TO2 um, you know, surface area. So what we are trying to do here is using sonication to form, and you know, maybe I don't show this, this is much clearer here, using the sono chemical process or the sono physical process to make micron sized TaO2 particles, which with porous TaO2 particles attached to it. So you can see that I have five micron particle, but I can still see the individual nanoparticles in there. So what it means is I can still have large surface area 
and also i can filter the nanometer the the tao2 after the photocatalysis reactions in fact i have to show you the data so i'm just going to skip these things what i'm trying to show here is that the size distribution of the tao2 micro or zinc oxide micro that we prepared the, using this methodology using this methodology so you can see that the size distribution is much larger okay so size distribution is in the micron range but when you look at the surface of these materials they still have nanoporous structure okay so what it means is i can still have large surface area that i need for higher catalytic reactions but end of the day i can easily filter these compounds after the photocatalytic reactions okay so here i'm showing one example where we take the methylene blue and we are we are comparing the decomposition of the methylene blue with the nano sized zinc oxide or the p25 nano tao2 to that of the micro you can see that whether i use p25 or the micro tao2 the efficiency this is the same what it means is i'm not losing the surface area same is true for zinc oxide the advantage here is after this reaction it will be very hard for me to filter the p25 or the nano zinc oxide whereas it is much easier for me to filter the micro tao2 and also reuse them much you know without losing the uh, functionality so that's where sono chemistry on its own may not be good for decomposing organic pollutants but sono the physical effects of sono chemistry and combination of sono chemistry with other oxidation process will be beneficial for decomposing organic pollutants and i think we are reaching almost like one hour mark so i will just spend maybe a few minutes to show you that ultrasound is heavily used in um, wastewater treatment not for simply decomposing the pollutants but for dislodging the pollutants from sludges for example or contaminated uh, uh, soil for example once you dislodge them then you may be able to simply use uh, hydrogen peroxide or ozone or those kind of oxidizing agents to efficiently decompose the molecules so here i am showing some um, some commercial units that are available the one that you see here it is used uh, for um, soil contaminated soil treatment assume that you have a localized contamination for example uh, if a fertile land is contaminated with um, oil then you can dig that sand put it into uh, into a container uh, as a slurry, slurry like with water pump it through the ultrasound unit that can be for example used to dislodge the pollutant if the pollutant level is too small too low you can also decompose using the small amount of radicals and also if the pollutant is volatile if it can get into the bubble then you can also completely decompose it within the bubble so csaro here in melbourne has demonstrated that you can treat the contaminated soil very efficiently using this kind of um, flow through ultrasound unit which is operating around 4 kilowatt they have also built 48 kilowatt units that has this kind of um, you know flow through arrangement again for dislodging um, pollutants or decomposing uh, pollutants uh, present in water or soil and this unit is now uh, in operation in, in many of the uh, european um, cities where they use the um, the the high frequency sorry high intensity ultrasound primarily for uh, disintegration of the sludge uh, or for example biosolids so that you can separate the the pollutant and then you can treat them much uh, easier otherwise what happens is the pollutants will be sitting inside the sludge or or colloidal materials they won't come out even if you try to treat with the uh, conventional oxidation process so these are the commercial units that are available we um, you know are currently in, in you know discussing or we try to kind of use this kind of um, uh, combined technology for um, wastewater recycling 
Uh, this is just a proposal at this stage. If we get some funds, we may be able to construct this. So the idea here is that we are, we are combining 20 kilohertz ultrasound to generate that physical force that we need for dislodgement. And then time for some process, the, the, the decomposition to happen. So what we can do is once you dislodge the pollutant, you can send it through a filtration membrane so that you get water with the dissolved contaminants here. Those dissolved contaminants then can be decomposed by means of um, you know, high intensity UV lamp or oxidizing agents here. And then any kind of uh, hydrophobic pollutants can be decomposed using high frequency units. So you can see that we are trying to combine uh, a low frequency membrane technology and high frequency units, including UV to decompose all sorts of pollutants, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, bi biological pollutants, et cetera and then pump it through a hydrodynamic habitation zone that can treat different ways, the, the final uh, you know, leftover pollutants here so that you can get pure water that is coming through. And we are trying to show that um, it is economically viable to treat large quantities of water. And we have submitted this uh, for, for some funding from, from um, some water companies or wastewater companies. And if you are successful, this may be um, you know, a, a useful technique that can be implemented in different places for, you know, even if you, you can implement similar thing for um, you know, hospitals, for example, where you have high level of uh, pharmaceutical contaminants. So before you, um, um, you know, discharge the wastewater with large amount of uh, pharmaceutical contaminants, you can pump that water through here, and then that water can be used for um, you know, uh, agricultural purpose and so on. So that is um, you know, one of the plans that's uh, in train for us in fu for future. So what I have uh, shown you in the past kind of 50, 55 minutes is that ultrasound um, or sonar chemistry alone cannot be used as an uh, sole advanced oxidation process in terms of decomposing organic pollutants, but can be combined with other techniques to make hybrid technology for decomposing various pollutants uh, efficiently, both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, but also the physical forces can be used in this kind of dislodgement or um, you know, um, disintegration uh, processes for sludge treatment and also biosolids treatment. So I'm, you know, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that I, I know I rest a bit but I just wanted to give you an overview rather than going through individual examples of mechanisms so that um, it gives you some sort of uh, overview. And if you want to get some further uh, detailed information on any specific uh, processes, uh, you are more than welcome to contact me and I will be able to give you some additional uh, support in terms of uh, papers and also um, further discussion through Zoom and other meetings. So I'd like to again, thank you all uh, for listening to, to this talk. And I'm now happy to answer any questions that you, you may have. Thank you, Professor Ashok Kumar, for this uh, excellent talk. So now we can go for uh, uh, panel discussions. Dr. Uh, Shivashankar, sir, please. Hello. Ah, yes, yes, visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am audible, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can, I can hear you. Hello, how are you? Uh, very fine, sir. How are you doing, sir? Good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think after four months, we are meeting again. Yeah, we are lucky. You know, uh, we, were lucky that we, we, we were lucky that we met four months before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I don't know again uh, when we are going to be, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, just uh, I want to have uh, some uh, few uh, you know, uh, clarifications you know, on ultrasonic applications, may, uh, basically. Because yep. we have done n number of you know, studies on wastewater treatment, nanoparticles, and I think the application of ultrasound is uh, wide. Okay, so there is no any restriction. We could be able to apply in any kind of field uh, in materials or physics, chemistry, wherever it is. So one basic uh, uh, question that I keep on know when uh, still I started way back in 2004. Uh, the only question that arises is that. So how far we could be able to take it into larger scale? 
because we know that there are a lot of restrictions on this ultrasonic processes the volume restriction power restriction cost restrictions can you please yeah. elaborate on this uh, I, th I think you know you're right and that was what i was also trying to highlight during my talk so um, you know let's assume that you have a, a, a reservoir full of water you know hundreds of gallons of water staying there contaminated with one micromole of a contaminant and if you try to use ultrasound to treat that much of water that has very small amount of contaminant it is not economically viable but take another scenario where, um, you know, as I said, you have um, a large quantity of uh, wa um, uh, contaminated water coming from a chemical, chemical industry or a um, hospital for, with pharmaceutical contaminants, where the contaminant concentration is much higher. And also it is a part of a, a solid material like a, you know, sludge or, or biosolids, those kind of things. So in that situation, if you are trying to use conventional um, uh, treatment, it's not going to work. And that's where ultrasound will be very efficient. So where, where you can say that, okay, if I now combine ultrasound with some oxidizing um, you know, process, so the oxidizing process will provide enough radicals or oxidizing species to oxidize the pollutant. But if the pollutant is uh, hiding inside a solid material, it's not going to come to be in contact with the, uh, the chemical that you are using. In that case, these physical forces that we have can be used for that dislodgement purposes. So we do have some areas where ultrasound will be very efficient and also unique that you cannot get that advantage from other processes. But there are some places where you are not going to even achieve um, um, any kind of um, improvement with um, and losing lots of energy. That's why I showed that reactor that I showed you. So the, the, re that reactor, if it is successful, then what we are talking about is high contaminated, like a sludge that can be treated before it is going into uh, a, you know, a normal drainage, which means that drainage will be less contaminated. So end of the day, that will be easy to, to be treated. So there are some specific places that you can use ultrasound for cleaning purposes or for uh, wastewater treatment purposes, but you cannot use it for, um, you know, for example, simply purify um, small contaminated water for drinking purposes. Yeah. I, I think that's where the focus should be. That's why yeah. in European countries nowadays, they mostly use it for uh, waste, waste sludge treatment so that they can clear, get clean water out of the sludge. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, so another thing, sir, so now actually um, of wastewater treatment, I think we have uh, enough of studies that is done. So can you give a direction on which, you know, now recently now people have started working on e-waste, okay? So extracting metals and uh, and then mostly on solid waste uh, treatment now. So yeah. can you just uh, tell me what are things that rest in ultrasound that you could be able to you know get more uh, you know, useful out of it? I, I, so I think you know this is where ultrasound is very useful, and I don't think many people are trying it. You know, one, one of the things that if you use that uh, waste sludge treatment unit. And if you have a e-waste, but you, you know, you cannot put a, a, a large e-waste into that, but you have to maybe make a powder out of it. And then it'll be easy for you to dislodge the material from the waste. But you know, just to give you an example, um, ultrasound is heavily used for cleaning purposes. You know that, okay? So if you go back to, um, you know, several years, ultrasound, they, they have big ultrasonic bath to clean um, the prop, um, aircraft propellers. Now the uh, aircraft has large propellers. They basically dip into the ultrasonic bath, big baths for cleaning. The reason for that is a normal cleaning process cannot reach into small uh, you know, holes and, 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 and small um, areas where the, the oil or contaminants are uh, sitting there. So what is good with the ultrasound is that 
you can create the shear or the cavitation process in small um, areas. And that micro streaming can help to dislodge the, the waste. That's why they are using it for dental treatment. Now, uh, when you have a cavity, they put an ultrasonic horn into the, uh, to the teeth or tooth, and they create cavitation locally so that that shear can clean the, the um, um, you know, any contaminant that you have in a small area, which cannot be done by con conventional cleaning processes. So um, I think, in my opinion, you do have really a good um, application in e-waste treatment for ultrasound. But if you have a large bath, for example, you, you took say, uh, a motherboard of a computer, in principle, you can just dip the, the, the um, motherboard. And if you sonic it, basically you can dislodge things. I, I think that's high, high potential there. Yeah, yes. So another thing, sir, can you, uh, oh, because we have uh, different types of ultrasonic equipments, basically. Uh, one is the horn type and other one is the bath type. Uh, can you give more insight into the uh, the differences? Because we have used the same kind of system for wastewater treatment itself. We get different, different results. Sometimes ultrasound horn gives a better, sometimes bath gives a better results. Because on is something like directly we are inducing the uh, uh, the waves, and the bath is indirect through the water medium that is there. So yeah. uh, even for nanoparticle also we have experience that sometimes bath gives a better uh, nanoparticle size and shape when compared to the horn. So how to have a better clarity on the usage of uh, these uh, equipments? Okay, so if you want to use, for example, uh, the strong shear forces. Three, okay. If you take an ultrasonic bath, you are talking about the ultrasonic cleaning, cleaning bath. Yes. But normally, um, you know, if, um, unfortunately I cannot draw it. So basically if I take, this is my ultrasonic bath, there'll be two or four transducers at the bottom. And then in the bath itself, you'll have maybe one or two liters of water. Yes. Okay. So what you are doing is you are putting energy into a large volume of water so the energy per unit volume in an ultrasonic bath is much lower. Whereas if I have a horn with the, the liquid, but even if I flow through in a close enclosure, then the power per unit volume is much higher. Okay. So sometimes, for example, you say that the bath is better, mainly most probably because if I if you have an ultrasonic horn and if you have a large volume here, your activity is limited to this area, okay? Whereas in an ultrasonic bath, if you're lucky, if you put the, um, the the treating liquid closer to the transducer, you may have a better effect. Okay. So that's where what you need to do is you need to, um, uh, you know, if you're trying to use an ultrasonic bath or a, or a horn, you have to map the cavitation field. And once you map the cavitation field, then you know where the cavitation occurs, then you'll be able to to get what you want. So um, ultrasonic horn is much better if you need high energy density. But what is important is your liquid uh, volume is much smaller. So what you do is you pump through the liquid so that the horn is sitting like this. So the liquid, all the liquid is going through that small area, the active zone. So it's a it's an engineering part of it that that you have to play with. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, sir. Another uh, thing is that so usually we say that the number of bubbles always helps in uh, increasing the efficiency of the uh, sonication process. Uh, but the kind of bubble that we uh, no, uh, uh, through some aerator, we used to bubble either air or organ or whatever, maybe the gases. So sometimes those things will, uh, no, if suppose we are using a horn, then it is going to you no know, stick on to it and uh, that may have an uh, uh, lower efficiency. Sir. So can you just tell me whether how far you no, know, or in what way that we could efficiently bubble like a particular gas and we get the maximum efficiency out of it. So what is important is, um, you, you know, if I want to do the power effect, so yes. let's say this is y-axis, this is exact, this is where power is. 
if you look into the efficiency of anything that you do, with the increase in power, it increases, and much higher power, it just decreases. Okay, so there's an optimal power. The reason is the same thing. If you generate too many cavitation bubbles, then they will act against you. Thus, bubbles are good scatterers of sound waves. So what happens is once you generate more than what you need, then these bubbles will act against you. So it is always better not to put too much bubble into the system. So that, that again is an optimization process. But what you can do is, if you want to still uh, you know, have an optimal process, if you do a flow through and based on the residence time, you may be able to control also that. So you can have large amount of gas, but also high power. But what you are doing is you are limiting the residence time. That again is an, a little bit of engineering involved. But my recommendation at this stage is once you reach a limit, but by putting more bubbles is uh, will have a negative impact. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for the clarification. So I have asked, uh, I think, uh, more deep into it so that uh, even the those who are watching also you know, will get benefit out of using the process and they could go for an, uh, their own, uh, design their own system for their applications. Yeah, you know, if I, um, I didn't, I don't have examples in uh, wastewater treatment, but currently we are working with um, three food companies yes. to uh, make, um, you know, the processing at much larger scale through your flow through system. And there we have to show that um, the process that we are introducing uh, will, be, will be at a minimum cost with maximum benefit. So we could demonstrate that at this stage for, for three food companies, including one of the uh, things that I mentioned before was, we now have a grant with the Gates Foundation to deliver functional foods into common, uh, you know, fun functional materials through common food. And those kind of applications, I, I do have, um, you know, a, a flow diagram to show you how that can be done. But because my, uh, you know, in recent time, my primary area is not into wastewater, I'm not focusing on that part. Yeah, that I think so. These kind of you know, sir, uh, the applications and the findings that what you are doing will uh, help uh, the researchers on this field will you know to fo more focus on it because this is one barrier that always you know we used to face from uh, the audience wherever we go. The first question they ask is that how could you able to apply it in large scale? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a you know, uh, gives an uh, encouragement for us to focus more on. That. And, and that's where I also showed you some photographs also. Yes, sir. Yes, you I can see. There are things. Thank you, sir. That's all from me. Uh, thank you, Shivasimha, sir. Yeah. So you. next uh, we can go for uh, uh, Dr. Shankar, please. Shankar Chakma, please. Hi, sir. So very nice, no? So it was very interesting. So. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So regarding that, so based on uh, hello, so am I, I can audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sir, uh, this, uh, you have said the uh, micro particles sometimes is a uh, beneficial. I mean, that's a better than particles. So, in terms of so. Uh, so what I have seen, like, uh, like a particle size also plays a very important role during that uh, sonolysis or sonocatalysis processes. So because that's a cavity, that's a, I mean, that's a uh, nucleation and a formation there. So it uh, provides uh, lots of nucleation sizes. So uh, like depending on the size and the surface area available. So now in the micro particles is how that's, a, I mean, that's a, how can you just benefit the uh, photocatalytic process or enhance the photocatalytic process so uh, because it's a it's a size is a comparatively is a high and uh, yeah so how it is the i mean it's control that yeah. uh, process so in, in this case what yeah. we are trying to do is uh, you know um, i agree with you that if you try to use say p25 which has much much higher surface area then your photocatalytic process is um, um, more efficient but uh, as i mentioned during my talk is uh, if you try to filter it then it is difficult just because it's too small so what um, yeah, 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 right. 
what the process that we are trying to develop is, we want to, to say for example, stick P25 particles together. Okay. So they are just sticking without fusing. And the way that we achieve that is we put this TMO2 into a polymer matrix or a polymer solution. And the polymer solution forms basically a, a, a micro particle. The polymer, the polymer particle is like this with lots of TMO2 around. As I said, they are not fusing. They're just um, you know, sitting around. And then what we do is we we burn the polymer. During that burning process, this TA wood and this TA wood will be just sticking like this, but not fusing. So end of the day, that micro particle will have same surface area as the TA wood too, because we are still having that porous structure. So we can check the surface area after we made the micro particle. The surface area is the same and the photocatalytic activity is the same. So we are, we are not increasing the photocatalytic activity. Only advantage here is that after you do the treatment, you can just use a normal filter to filter it, or even you, you can use a centrifuge. So in this case, we are not losing the surface area or the particle size. They're still 25 nanometers, but that we just put them all into one, one um, in a ball. So, uh, uh, the, the other question that you asked is whether they can generate more cavitation. The answer is yes, because they have more pores during sonication process. In addition to sonophotocatalysis that you do, they can also serve as um, you know, um, the cavitation nuclei. Okay. Sir, uh, in the biomedical application, you have shown that uh, something uh, this uh, protein cell formation, that's a creation of protein cell, then encapsulation. So in the most of the time, what I do feel like, uh, so in the nature, I mean, that's a proteins or if my uh, application of ultrasound also denatures the proteins. So that breaks the, I mean, that's a protein bonding and those. So what are the parameters should be, I mean, uh, to be, I mean, the uh, control during that process? Maybe yeah. you can, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically what, in that particular process, you're right, we are denaturing the protein. So there, the idea is we are putting some nutrients inside or a, or a drug inside. So we don't worry about the functionality of the shell. The shell is very thin. Okay, so in that case, the denatured protein forms a shell, whereas the material that we have put inside, it is not denatured because these processes only for five seconds. Sonicate only for five seconds. Five seconds sonication is enough to cross-link the protein, but not the, the liquid in there. But there's another part. So if I'm trying to use this for uh, milk treatment, for example, if I take milk and then try to process the milk yeah. to improve the functionality of the uh, milk protein, or if I try to use the milk protein as an, a stabilizer for an emulsion, there, it is important that I don't denature 100% protein. And again, because we are only sonicating for 10 or 15 seconds, so if I have, uh, uh, you know, let's assume that I have 100 proteins, I will only denature maybe one protein. The rest of the 99 proteins are not denatured. So we have checked in our, uh, for example, the uh, emulsification process where we try to emulsify um, omega-3 oil in milk using dairy proteins. After the processing, we checked the functionality of the, or the um, physical property and functional properties of these uh, dairy proteins. And we observed that 99.5% of the proteins are did not denatured. Only 0.5% protein gets denatured but they are used for stabilizing the, the, the material that we have. So what I'm trying to say here is, yes, you will have some denaturation happening, but it is only a very, very small fraction that will not affect the total functionality of the system. I mean, that's, it's uh, increased also stability. So I think, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, so, for example, once you protect the, um, let's say vitamin E, Let's mm -hmm. say that uh, you take vitamin E and then mix it with yogurt. 
and then try to store it for some time and give it to people. In that case, that vitamin E is open to oxygen. So it can easily be oxidized. Whereas if you have a protein shell around it, then you have protection. So you don't, this um, um, vitamin will be self-stable for much longer time. And that's, that's the purpose of that particular uh, you know, pro process that we do. So uh, in uh, one of the uh, this, uh, work, you have uh, shown that uh, this contaminated uh, soil treatment using that ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So it's contaminated soil has is very high viscous and uh, it's sometimes uh, application of ultrasound is, uh, is close yeah. to impossible. So in this case, what, what, they, what, what they normally do is they make a slurry. So, for example, you take um, you know forty percent water and soil, and then you mix it with the pump, and then you pump the slurry. Okay. okay? okay. And and because you are using twenty kilohertz, the shear forces are so strong um, that can handle the system. But of course, if you have very high viscous, like if, for example, if you try to sonicate honey then you will break the horn because uh, the sound waves will not go through the high viscous medium. So here it is not the viscosity, it's the solid fraction will be high, but still we will have water. And then you recover the water after that, but you know, you, you pump the slurry mm -hmm. and then you get the clean soil and filter the water out of it. And then you can use, reuse that water. That, uh, that work is so, not by, uh -huh. done by us. It was done by the CSARO uh, in Melbourne. Okay, 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 okay. Sir, uh, so we have seen that ultrasound is hugely used in the uh, this uh, water treatment plant. So uh, can you please enlighten us that how to uh, implement this in the gaseous waste system, like uh, reduction or removal of NOx, SOx, or CO2 conversion? So how can we, and that's, uh, in which direction should we move to in, in the, you know, that, 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 that's where um, I, I told you that if you're trying to simply oxidize or reduce uh, a pollutant, simply using sonication process, I think in my opinion, on its own, it is not viable. It's not economically viable. You can do some, uh, you know, you have, we have, um, you know, thousands of papers saying that uh, sonolytic degradation of, you know, chlorophenol and so on. That is good for understanding the mechanism, but for real treatment for big large scale, it is uh, a difficult process. That's where you need to look into the hybrid techniques. For example, combining ultrasound with something else where you can avoid the formation of um, intermediates and you can improve the mineralization process. And so if you, you, know, if you have volatile chemicals, then it's a good process. So for example, if you have something that's very easily, uh, that has very low boiling point, then it can get into the bubble and then completely disintegrate due to the heat. But in my opinion, ultrasound or sonochemical oxidation process is good if you have highly concentrated pollutant, uh, an aqueous medium with highly concentrated pollutants where the efficiency will be much higher. So the volume is not much bigger, but you can easily uh, treat it with, uh, with, with um, uh, uh, short, shorter times. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, sir, another one, uh, like uh, you have uh, done also that uh, exfoliating of uh, graphene oxide. So we have been there finding some difficulties. Only the ultrasound, so okay, this ultrasound that's exfoliation it's not so easy. So what are the difficulties? How, how do we, I mean, that's a handle those difficulties, uh, deal with those, those difficulties and parameters should be optimized and if you can. Uh, I think the main thing that you need to worry about is that um, the energy density or exfoliation, you need really high uh, shear. Okay. okay if you okay. try to use an ultrasonic bath, the shear that you generate will not be sufficient. So for exfoliation, horn is better. But horn also, you have to have really, uh, uh, you know, small volume in the working area. Okay. So if you have much larger volume like this, and if you have small horn, it's not going to be uniform. But what you can do is you can make a, a, a cylinder, and then you can okay. flow through that, so that all the solutions have close contact to the horn. Okay. And as you know, 
only in horn system you have very strong shear generated close to the horn. Okay, so uh, I think it's almost done. Let's so uh, in fact that uh, one of the cases uh, like one in the yellow color that graph you have shown like uh, uh, so this has a low pH favors something uh, US ultrasound process so low yeah. pH value so what is exactly I mean that's a uh, what I was trying to say is um, if if you have um, you know let's say, say that you have phenol okay phenol as a pollutant and if we have a cavitation bubble. If phenol molecules come to the interface, the hydroxyl radical can easily attack. Okay. Yeah. So, but instead of phenol, if I take the proton and make that as a minus phenolate ion, like you know, phenyl ring with the O minus, because of the charge, it is water soluble. So it won't go to the interface. So what we can do is by adjusting the pH, we can make it neutral. If it is neutral, it is more hydrophobic, then it go to the interface. So the oxidation efficiency is dependent upon the interfacial concentration of the pollutant. And that interfacial concentration, you can change by playing with the pH of this, uh, the medium. So it's, it's basically a completely based on the compound, pollutant. So yes. how it's a deprotonation yeah. or something yeah. protonation. Yeah. So we can just uh, push them to the uh, interface or something uh, you can put them Okay. Exactly. So basically, if you make the compound more hydrophobic, yeah, uh, then it goes to the interface. Okay. And so, based on the compound, sometimes you may need to increase the pH. Sometimes you need to decrease the pH. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so you have gone. I mean, that's uh, done lots of work. So, can you suggest which one is the best frequency for the like uh, wastewater treatment? So, you have shown like. Low frequency is also having that uh, formation of uh, OH radical or hydrogen peroxide is less. Then it's increased. Then uh, if it goes beyond uh, like a thousand something, uh, yeah, fifty six uh, kilohertz, it's again reduced. So uh, how, which is the best for uh, wastewater treatment? Let's assume that you are only looking to oxidation or reduction reaction. For example, you just want to use the hydroxyl radicals for oxidizing something or um, you know hydrogen atom for reducing then the best frequency range is from about 200 kilohertz up to 800 kilohertz that so basically this is frequency this is yield mm -hmm. from 20 kilohertz it's go up so this is around 200 and then it is almost constant up to 800 and then it start, uh, starts to drop down so for chemical reactions, if you don't worry about the physical forces, only chemical reactions, 200 to 800 is good. But if you're trying to use, if you need say both physical and chemical, then you have to go to lower frequency. For example, if you're trying to make emulsion polymerization, to make an emulsion, you need a shear force, which means you need low frequency. In fact, we have done uh, um, uh, some experiments where we also use 20 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz combination, dual frequency. Yeah. So 20 kilohertz is used for shear force and the 300 kilohertz is used for chemical reactions. That system is also good. Then you are using both. So depending upon the application, you may want to use either low frequency or high frequency or a combination of both. Okay, but okay. Uh, if you just pure chemistry, 200 to about 800. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, sir. So for clearing so out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shankar. Uh, Dr. Shankar. Uh, I have a one question. Um, sir, uh, uh, you mentioned that this uh, catalyst can be prepared using the ultrasound. Then suppose if you are preparing one supported catalyst, we can use ultrasound or we can use mechanical shear or mechanical steering. Mm. So what is the advantages of using ultrasound for preparing the supported catalyst? Suppose if I want to prepare a catalyst iron oxides over uh, a carbonaceous material, mm. what are the advantages over this ultrasonic method over these uh, mechanical methods? 
I, I think you know, if I, if you don't mind, I can quickly share the screen and show you. Yeah, yeah, right. So, Okay. Uh, can you can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please. Okay. So these these are the this is the difference. So basically, what um, this this particular work that they are trying to do is they are trying to load silver iodide on PaO2. This is by stirring. This is by ultrasound. Okay. You can see that the uh, loading and distribution is quite homogeneous. Okay. Okay. So that, that that's the advantage. The advantage here is that when you try to use the the um, shear forces, the homogeneity of the loading and the efficiency of the loading is much much higher. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think there is uh, no other questions from uh, experts also. So we will go for the final session of this uh, program. Okay. I would like my, express my gratitude to Professor Ashok Kumar, Muthupandi Ashok Kumar for. Um, uh, for his wonderful lectures. He explained the basics of uh, acoustic station. Then most of the papers, if you are reading, we will get only the, uh, say, sonolysis is, is giving some results. Sonophotocatalysis, it is giving some results. But what is the, why it is required, we need to combine the uh, sonolysis with photocatalysis or sonolysis with uh, electrocatalysis or sonophotophenton or so sonolysis with uh, phenton. That came... Uh, today, from this talk, we came to know that this this is the ba basic mechanism. That means sonolysis cannot degrade the hydrophilic compounds. So uh, I would again I would uh, like my express my gratitude to Professor Muthupandian for his, giving the wonderful lectures. After his the talk uh, lecture, uh, Doctor uh, Shiva Shankar and uh, Doctor Shankar give the discuss the uh, advantages or advances in the, all these fields. Even uh, Shiva Shankar showed the, what are the disadvantages, advantages of uh, this problem or in practical fields. Again, I explained, I, again, I express my gratitude to Dr. Shiva Shankar and Dr. Shankar Chakma for uh, making this uh, uh, panel discussion more vibrant. Thank you for all joining with us for this uh, session. So tomorrow, at the same time, tomorrow, three o'clock, Professor uh, Emmanuel Mauser will join us for uh, uh, the eighth day lecture. He will talk about the reactions of hydroxyl radicals with all the pollutants. What are the pollutant degradation mechanisms, all these things. Till then, bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, Ashok Thank you, thank Dr. Nubish, for a wonderful arranging this wonderful lecture. Thank you, thank, you, yeah, thank, thank, you, you, thank you, sir. Thank you all for, for, for uh, in organizing this, uh, in particular, uh, Professor Nidesh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Hope, hope yeah. to see you at some stage.